Genesis chapter 21. All right, open up your Bibles to Genesis and we'll look at chapter 21. If you recall, where we last left off is where Abimelech, he is speaking with Abraham, and he wants to make a covenant. The covenant is that as Abraham becomes more rich, that his descendants and his family will be at peace with his descendants and his family. Why? Because there's no doubt he's noticing that God's blessing is really falling on Abraham. So because God is blessing him more and more, he can see he's going to become a mighty nation. So with the covenant made between these two men, the verses are as follows. Verse 24, and Abraham said, I will swear. So he responded to Abimelech's covenant with I will swear, I promise. Verse 25, and Abraham reproved Abimelech. So let me know if I'm out of bounds. Abraham, he's reproving Abimelech of something. Now, what is he reproving him of? Because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently te taken away. So Abraham has a talk with Abimelech. He gets upset with him due to a well of water that Abimelech's own servants, his own servants, taken, uh, took away from Abraham by violence, not peacefully, but by violence. So Abimelech responds at verse 26, and Abimelech said, I want not who hath done this thing. Abimelech answers, I don't know who did this. What not, what is the same, uh, is an old English word for no. So it means no. He had no idea about who did the deed. Neither didst thou tell me, neither yet I heard of it, but today. He's saying, you didn't even tell me, so I didn't know about that. Furthermore, I didn't hear about it until today. That's how he answered. Now remember, I'm trying to explain each and every word and phrase. I know it may sound a little bit um, redundant or a little bit uh, boring. However, the point of this whole Bible study is to make sure you understand each and every word, not some kind of deep doctrine. No, it's just to explain every word, whatever doctrine the Lord's trying to show you in the verses, then we compare, okay? And we're studying context, word for word, and scripture with scripture. That's the method of biblical interpretation. Verse 27, And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech. So Abraham, he's taking livestock, so sheep and oxen, hands them over to Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. So these two men made a covenant with the exchange of livestock to seal the deal. You'll notice here at verse 28, however, and Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. So why is he getting ewe lambs? Why is he getting female sheep from the flock by themselves? He set them aside, seven in particular. Why did he do that? Verse 29, Abimelech's asking him that. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? So Abimelech's asking Abraham, what is the meaning here? Is there some meaning with these seven ewe lambs that you set apart by themselves away from the other sheep and oxen that you've given to me? So he set them by themselves, the seven, meaning away from the regular sheep and oxen that he handed over to Abimelech. And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me. So Abraham answers, These seven ewe lambs that you're going to take away from me. Right here, you'll notice seven ewe lambs. Abraham mentions what they are is a witness, that I have digged this well, at verse 30. 
So Abraham saying, I dig the well, these seven ewe lambs are, are set aside in particular as a witness. So sheep and oxen is to seal the deal of the covenant. The seven ewe lamb is proof, it's evidence that I am the one who digged up the well. That's what Abraham did. We're going to look at Numbers 23. Numbers 23. And Revelation 5. Numbers 23 and Revelation 5. It's, this is very interesting how Abraham took it as common sense on the number 7 for sheep. That's very interesting. Throughout the Bible, you're going to notice that people had a common sense thinking, or at least people who knew the Word of God, had a common sense thinking that what God is pleased with is the number seven when it comes to sacrifice, when it comes to altar worship. So they took that as common sense where the best number to pick is seven. As some of you might recall, at Genesis that we studied, the Lord, he took a particular interest with the number seven. At Genesis chapter two, the Bible says that he sanctified it. So there's something about the number seven here. People call it God's number. They will call it God's number. They will also call it completion. Completion. So that pretty much seals the deal. That's the idea. It's completed. To make a complete covenant, the most complete covenant that will really seal the deal, let's put seven new lambs. That's the idea Abraham is thinking. Now look at a false prophet who even knew it would be common sense to offer this much to the Lord. Numbers 23, verse 1. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. You'll notice that the false prophet realized that in order for him to intercede on Balak's behalf and get the Lord to do what he wants to do is to build up seven, because God is pleased with seven. Seven altars with seven oxen, seven rams. Look at Revelation 5, Revelation 5. Notice that God himself sees a perfect lamb, a complete sacrifice, where seven is associated with it. Look at Revelation chapter 5. And we'll look at verse 6. Verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. Now that's the most perfect lamb with the complete sacrifice you can think of. Amen? Amen? Now look what number associates with that. Having seven horns and seven, high, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Amen. Notice how God puts seven, seven, seven. Not just one, but several times. Amen. It shows that's a big deal to God. I mean, there are so many different examples that we can see how seven is important. That's why people will put seven with their sacrifice, with their altar of worship. Now, I don't know, but I think this would be life-changing. I haven't really dug into this, but I think what will be life-changing is if you dig into sacrifice or altar or worship and you tie it with seven somehow in your practical living, it might do wonders. Now, I don't know. I'm just throwing in what I can see from the scriptures. If you want to really please the Lord, there's something about seven here that might really please him. Another th thing that we noticed in the Bible, a disciple says, how many times should I yeah. forgive him? And then Jesus mentions about 70 times seven. So there's a seven thing that is very important to God. Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. We'll look at chapter 21, verse 31. Chapter 21, verse 31. Wherefore he called that place Beersheba. Okay, wherefore, meaning that's the reason why he called this place where he digged up the well Beersheba. Beersheba. 
Uh, what is Beersheba meaning? The idea is it means seven wells. Seven wells. Another thing I would recommend, I mean, there can be a lot of gold in this one, but I'm not digging into this because I want to just go, uh, I just want to go through Genesis as much as I can. But I would recommend studying Beersheba, looking up every word that would be significant to the Lord and see how it would tie to seven or to God's number or to his completion. If you do that, that might be really interesting. I think you can make good sermons out of this for Beersheba. But that's all I'll say. The next part of verse 31, because there they swear, both of them. Okay, so in other words, Abraham called this place Beersheba because that's where they both made a covenant. That's where they both swore, made a promise. Verse 32, thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. That's self-explanatory. Hence, they made a promise at Beersheba. Now, if this place was called Beersheba by Abraham at that time when he made the deal with Abimelech, there is a question that we've got in our minds. The question is in verse 14. Do you remember? In verse 14, Hagar, she was wandering in the wilderness of Beersheba, but the name was not given yet. Now, the answer is pretty simple. It's because Abraham or Hagar is not the author here. Moses is the author. So Moses, he was long after Abraham. He knew that the terrain Hagar was wandering at verse 14 was in Beersheba, even though that wasn't the name that time. But Moses realized that the place that they were particularly wandering is the wilderness of Beersheba. The official name was given at verse 31. Okay, we're going to look at verse 32. <clears throat> the, uh, the next phrase of verse 32 reads, Then Abimelech rose up, <clears throat> and Phi called the chief captain of his host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. So Abimelech got up, his uh, chief captain of his own army, which is host, Phi called. They both returned to the land of the Philistines. Verse 33, and Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So Abraham, what he does, he plants a grove. He plants a grove in Beersheba. When he plants that grove in Beersheba, he called on the name of the Lord, meaning he prayed to God. And the Lord is also known as the everlasting God. He lives forever. If you look at the book of Deuteronomy, go over there, Deuteronomy chapter 12, Deuteronomy chapter 12. God, he is not pleased with groves being built. But Abraham, he builds a grove. So did he sin against the Lord? Or why doesn't the Lord make a big deal out of that? Because... During that time, you have to understand something. Now, this is going to be helpful because we're going to mainly go through apologetics in this lesson today, believe it or not. There's a lot of things that Abraham did that today we would see it as sin, or even in the Bible, it would see it as sin. But there's one thing that I want to write down so that you can remember is cultural values. There's one thing you have to understand about cultural values. Throughout every time period, everybody has their own values. They have their own practices, how they do things, their own ways of how they deem uh, common sense. So uh, I, I want to make sure it's still there. I don't want it moved around, okay? I, all right, then. I'm the one that should move, it, so just let me know if I have to. Everybody has cultural values. The Lord... He's not an unreasonable God. He's not the one that would set up his own cultural values for you to live in. I know that might be shocking for some of you, but no, we're not like Mormons or even independent fundamental Baptists 
who think that uh, you, they have to dictate everything on how you act, talk, your mannerisms, and to the point of dressing. That they have dress codes and rules that can go over a hundred. Yeah. No, we, uh, God's not that type of God. Right. God, how he judges you is by according to your heart. Mm -hmm. So everybody has freedom to live their values, but how he judges your values is by your heart. Yeah. And then he looks at your heart and your intention, right. and then he'll judge it to be sin or not. Right. So God, how he does things, during the Old Testament, building a grove is not as much of a sin as today as we would have our own groves. Why? Because it's just a grove. That's what we're thinking. We just want to put something nice. Or some people, maybe Abraham's thinking here, because they made a covenant, he wants to build something nice. And because he's communicating with God, he wants to make it look pretty. Simple. But as cultural values keep going on, it's not just him. Other nations and cultures thought of the same thing as well. We should make it pretty when we build up our altar and call upon the name of our gods. So it became a pagan thing. So because it was so rampant with paganism, God, he said, okay, it's so confusing, and I don't want the world to think that my worship is following along the way with the pagans when they worship. My people are a particular people. That's what the Bible says. I want them to be a strange people, different from the world. So then he tells the Jews, you're not going to make a grove when you build an altar. That's the reason why. But during Abraham's time, it wasn't as rampant, it wasn't as bad. That's the reason why the Lord allowed it, and not only that, he can even honor it. Uh, let's look at Deuteronomy 12. Deuteronomy 12. We can see that this is condemned in the Bible. Now remember that. Cultural values. And God, he only goes by the heart. He judges by the heart. And then it's, this is important, the context of the age of that time. You got to go by society, the age of civilization, that time, how they do things. Think about it. Uh, the reason why we dress like this for church, for example, is not something Abraham would wear. He would probably laugh at you. He'd say, "Oh, why do you have to choke your own neck?" And I keep asking myself that. Why do I have to? Why do we have to choke our own necks with this one? If we had it our way. We'd uh, we'd burn our ties. Amen. <laughs> but the reason why that we're doing this and even wearing a tie is because this, the, age, this, uh, the age of this civilization, they realize for professional work ethics that this is your best attire. Right. And hence, the Lord, he judges the heart of man. Okay, then what's your best attire? Right. We know what it is. Put it on. That's why we put it on, even if we don't like it. So God, he judges by what's going on, the context of that age, and the intention of the heart. And God wants that from you. Now, that's going to be helpful when we look at the later verses. But let's first look at Deuteronomy chapter 12. It's condemned <clears throat> because the age of that time, the context of that age was wicked, so God doesn't like rose. Deuteronomy chapter 12, and we'll read verse 3. And he shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down their graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. You'll notice right here, God, he does not like groves. Let's go back, Genesis 22. Uh, Genesis 21, excuse me, Genesis 21. Verse 34, And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. So because of that covenant, he's able to leave, live peaceably with Abimelech, so he's able to live there, reside there. Sojourn means to temporarily reside, remember. So he's able to reside in the land of the Philistines for many days. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Perhaps the most famous story of Abraham. That's what we're going to get into. The most famous story of Abraham. Uh, if you have Dr. Rutman's Adler commentary, I would highly recommend this. Uh, how he did this story is just... 
very, very beautiful. It's very, very dramatic. It's quite a story how he did it. But let's look at verse 1. And it came to pass after these things. So, and it came to pass is the English phrase, as always, like, it just so happened later on. What happened? After these things, so after the events of Genesis 21, God did tempt Abraham. Okay, we got a problem right here. So God, it seems like he tempts people to sin, right? Well, no, that's not the case. What does it mean that God tempt Abraham? We're going to look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to see a contradiction here. The contradiction is that James says God doesn't tempt. But over here in Genesis, it says that God does tempt. Well, who's right? Is there a contradiction in the Bible then? Let's look at James chapter 1. This is one of the favorite passages used by Bible critics or atheists to so-called prove your Bible has a contradiction or an error. Look at James chapter 1. We'll look at verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Notice the last part. Neither tempteth he any man. Whoa, so God doesn't tempt. But Genesis 22 says that God did tempt. Might as well throw away your Bibles. The Bible contradicts itself. No, the thing is people don't want they didn't read the entire passage. They didn't look at the context. They just look at, they just nitpick verses that they like so that they can find something wrong and then rush to the conclusion, I have evidence and proof the Bible has a mistake. No, that's not uh, careful scrutiny. That's not careful examination. I thought we're in a higher educated society. I thought you're supposed to uh, have some critical thinking. Careful examination. No, apparently we don't live in that kind of society, even though they profess to. One is, did you even look up the definition of tempt? That's it. So tempt here, it can mean, we see one definition of meaning leading to sin, right? To seduce, to sin. Seduced to the flesh. But another definition, it means to test. It means to test. Now, if you don't believe that your God never tries you or tests you, then you don't know your Bible. If you know one thing about your God, he does test you. He does try you. And by the way, the book of James even told you that. It's very funny. James chapter 1, they weren't reading. 1 verse 13 and 14 shows you by context that the definition of this tempt has to do with seducing to sin. Keep reading. Verse 13 says God cannot be tempted with what? Evil. Evil. So that don't mean to try and test you where, okay, I'm going to make you do evil things and I'm an evil God. No, obviously the idea here is to seduce them to sin. So testing won't make sense if you combine that with evil. So it's a separate definition. Neither tempteth he any man. 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. See, it's your lust. It's seducing to the lust of the flesh. Verse 15, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. So the idea is where God doesn't tempt you is that God doesn't make you sin. Except you're a Calvinist. All right, anyways, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And we'll look at verse 2. Now, notice that James, he distinguishes the definition of temptation and tempt here. Look at James 1, 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Count it joy that you fall into sin? No, that's not what it means. Keep reading. Because uh, later on he mentioned that it's not a good thing. James is distinguishing. The next part, verse 3. Knowing this, that the what? 
trying of your faith worketh patience. That's what he meant by temptations. But then later on, he explains that at verse 13, 14, 15, that temptation has a different meaning. They didn't read. Okay, go back. Go back. Is it, wasn't that simple? It was that simple. You just had to look at James 1. They didn't read all of James 1. All right, let's look at Genesis 22. Genesis 22. So God, he's testing Abraham. Now here's the next uh, argument from the critics and from the atheists. So we're covering a lot of apologetics today. What did God test Abraham with? And said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. So God says, calls out Abraham, and Abraham answers, uh, Here I am. And behold, that word is constantly used again. Which, uh, behold, again, that means uh, before he's about to say something, the idea is, uh, to, uh, it's a word uh, signaling to pay attention to the next parts of what I'm about to say. That's the idea. Verse 2, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. So God says to Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you loved, and get thee into the land of Moriah. So God wants Abraham to take his son to the land of Moriah. Moriah, it means God is my instructor. So Moriah means God is my instructor. Now there's a, notice how this matches well with God testing Abraham. When God sets you apart for a certain location to go to, remember this, there's no coincidence with God. There's a reason behind it. If there's one thing you know about your God, place, time, situation, everything, there's a reason behind it. So he's about to teach Abraham a lesson. He wants to test him out. See his grade level. What does he say? Take the son to the Mount Moriah. Okay, no problem, God, I'll do that. The next part is the controversial part. And offer him there for a burnt offering. So he wants Abraham to offer Isaac as a burnt offering at Moriah as a sacrifice upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. So notice that if it's in the land of Moriah, there are several mountains there. So it's on one of those mountains that Abraham is going to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Okay, so there's a lot of things we're going to cover at verse 2. First of all, uh, the Lord tells Abraham to take his only son whom he loves. Okay, this is very important. Look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. There is absolutely no doubt there is a big meaning here. Isaac undoubtedly typifies Jesus Christ. Amen. What God is doing in this story and why God wants Abraham to do this is to signify, it's to picture what he's going to do with his son in the future. There is absolutely no doubt about that. It's very clear. Isaac pictures what Jesus Christ is about to do for us. Jesus' offering. But Isaac is known as only begotten son. That matches Genesis 22 too. Thine only son whom thou lovest. That matches. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Isaac is called only begotten son. That's very interesting. Hebrews chapter 11. Notice what the word of God reads at verse 17. Verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up what? His only begotten son. His only begotten son. From what I notice in the scripture, mostly, if not all the verses, only begotten son is only given to Jesus and Isaac. Wow. There is no doubt the Lord's doing something here. The Lord sees a picture. Isaac pictures Jesus Christ. 
We can see that at John chapter 3, verse 16, the famous verse, right? You can turn over there. It's good, right? It's good to turn there. John chapter 3 and verse 16. The only begotten Son, only Isaac and Jesus, it's for certain that God, he was trying to depict a picture of what his only begotten son will do at Calvary. Okay, we're going to look at uh, John chapter 3 and verse 16. Whom thou lovest, right? The Genesis 22 says, Thine only son whom thou lovest. So, for some of you who didn't know, the first time love is ever mentioned in your Bible is not Adam and Eve. Isn't that funny? That's not the first mention. It's not Adam and Eve. It's not husband and wife. It's a father with his only begotten son. Amen. First time love is mentioned. Why? It's as if God's going to give a first love, an ultimate love Amen. story, which is my only begotten son. You want to hear the greatest love story? This is the ultimate love story, and it's not Romeo and Juliet. It's not how people perceive with fornication and throw around love like a loose word. Look at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's amazing that first time love is mentioned is for the only begotten son, but how God did it is to pass it upon you. That's a beautiful thing. God passed it upon you through the love of his only begotten son. Let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. Another thing to observe at verse 2, some people wonder where this took place, where Abraham is about to sacrifice his son Isaac in Moriah. Well, Dr. Ruckman mentions that this is the same place where David actually was offering a sacrifice to God. Let's go to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, the last chapter. We're going to look at 2 Samuel, chapter 24, chapter 24. 2 Samuel, chapter 24. This area, at verse 24, And the king said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. <clears throat> so he took the place of Aruna threshing floor. And for some people who don't know where that was, it was at the land of Mount Moriah for some people who didn't know that. It was on that mount. That's why uh, King David, he made the deal where he can be able to buy it. Look at verse 25. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. This is where sacrifice, where offering was made. It was at this lamb. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed. If you uh, read this entire story, it's a beautiful picture where the Lord, he was about to pour his wrath upon a group of people, but there was a sacrifice made on that mount <clears throat> if Moriah was there, as Dr. Upman claimed. If that was the same land that David offered the sacrifice, it is interesting. It was by that sacrifice and burnt offering, it appeased the wrath of God. Amen. Now, I don't know if you got that just now. Or if some of you are saying amen to this, or you're just listening to me and don't get it, 
Did you hear what I just said? If that was the same place where David offered up a sacrifice to appease the wrath of God, that beautifully pictures the same thing with the only begotten son where he was offered as a sacrifice on that mount and it appeased the wrath of God. John 3, 16. God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish. See, it appeased the wrath of God in hell. <clears throat> Another thing is, that Dr. Ruckman mentioned. He claimed this is where David gave the offering and sacrifice, and he supposed it is also where Calvary was located, Golgotha, where Jesus Christ died on the cross. Now, I can't put 100% on both those cases with David and with Jesus Christ, but there is no doubt that David that he is closely aligned with Jesus Christ in your Bible, and that uh, the pictures is just way too strong with Isaac, David, and Jesus. So God, if he always has that tendency to always go by pictures, which he does, that's the character of your God, then you got pretty good evidence that it was the land of Moriah on what happened with those two cases. So it's very, very interesting. The Temple Mount, they say, is where Jesus Christ was supposedly crucified and where David bought the property where he made the sacrifice. So that doesn't belong to... Uh -huh. It belongs yeah. to David's people. Right. That's all I'll say, okay? Because <clears throat> he bought it. Amen. And another thing is Abraham. That's where supposedly at the Temple Mount he was going to offer up his only begotten son. Now, that means that piece of property is really precious to God. Amen. Go to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. Now, let's cover the controversy here. Verse 2, God tells Abraham, I want you to offer up your only begotten son as a sacrifice. So, hence, God approves of human sacrifices. What a, what a blasphemous, evil God, right? So this story is infamously used by your critics, and they're going to use it on you, that, see, God approves of human sacrifice. Now, obviously, God doesn't approve of human sacrifice. God, he sees this as something evil. But it seems like, in this passage, if human sacrifice was a sin... Why would God tell Abraham to do it? And why would Abraham do it without any question? If Abraham thought it was a sin, then he would have questioned God. He would have said, no, God. <clears throat> so why did he do it? Like, apparently, it was the norm, and God approves of human sacrifice, so your God is an evil God. Now, there are two answers to this. Two answers to this. One at Genesis chapter 22, Abraham, it is possible, he didn't think of his son that he would die as a sacrifice and that would be it. No, because if you look at Genesis chapter 22 and verse 5, when Abraham goes to offer up his son Isaac as a sacrifice, he actually told the young men at verse 5, uh, and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and what? Amen. Come again to you. So Abraham, it's like he knew that his son would not die as a sacrifice, but that they would return. Right, Another example is Hebrews 11. Go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Abraham basically believed God without any question so strongly that it is possible his faith was so strong that the Lord would never go through with this. But he's testing me with something, so I have to believe and trust in him that he's not going to do something evil. That's very possible. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. And then we'll look at verse 19. What did Abraham believe about Isaac? When verse 17, verse 17, by faith when he was tried offered up Isaac. So when he was about to offer Isaac and this was his trying, what did he account at verse 19? 
accounting that God was able to raise them up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So notice here, Abraham believed very worst case scenario, even if he dies, the Lord's not going to go through with this all the way, the human sacrifice. He's going to raise my son up Amen. from the dead. So we can see right here that possible interpretation number one <clears throat> is that the Lord does not condone human sacrifice and Abraham knew God wouldn't follow through all the way. But the biggest evidence is that God didn't approve of the human sacrifice because he stopped it yeah. at Genesis 22. If you look at Genesis 22, Genesis 22, verse 12, and he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. So notice here that God does not want Abraham to go through with the human sacrifice for his boy Isaac. So we know that God wasn't approving human sacrifice. Otherwise, why would he stop it? If he wanted to approve of it, he would have let Abraham burned up his son as an offering to him. Now, there's a second possibility. Let's go with the critics. Let's go with the critics here that in this case and scenario, let's say it was human sacrifice at this case. Well, then uh, you have to think of it this way. Even if very worst case scenario, God was approving of human sacrifice, it's the same thing you have to realize that Abraham and the other people, it may have been during their time, the answer is right here, guys. The answer is right here. The context of the age. You got to realize that th we're talking about uh, prehistoric times. We're talking about ancient civilization. What was the common sense of that time? Their own cultural values that time. You got to realize the cultural norms of that time was to marry your sister and brother. Hey, right? Yeah. Otherwise, today, we think of it in our norms and our values. No, that's disgusting. That's just wrong to have incest. So then, before you get all judgmental and judge them by their cult cultural norms and values of ancient times, remember what I argued many times. Well, they could do the same thing with you guys, with same sexes uh, necking each other. Like, they would see that as something that's heinous and that's just off. That's abnormal, not normal. They're trying to normalize it to you. Right. But that's not normal. So I thought that we learned in liberal universities that we shouldn't be judgmental, but we should be tolerant of other people's cultures and values, except the Bible's culture, I think. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's hypocritical. That's evil. Whereas you pinpoint them out on what's immoral or wrong to you, they can do the same as you. Now, we can all point fingers at each other and say, you're wrong and you're wrong and you're wrong. But to be quite honest, that's why when you go with morals being relative, you can never pinpoint what's wrong and what's right. And there has to be an absolute somewhere because when somebody commits murder in your heart, you're not going to think it's relative. You're going to feel like you've been wronged. So then... How do we judge values? The best thing, and that's the reason why the standard of morals and values is God. Yeah. Amen. Yep. So how does God do it? God, it's not a problem to him. He goes by the context of the age and judging their heart on that context of the age. Right. And then that's how he can determine the cultural values. That's why the way they live, their norms are going to be different from ours. And how God sees this is sin, but not today. This is sin in Moses' time, but not sin in Abraham's time. And it's the same thing when you talk about marrying your brother and sister, because Adam and Eve, when they had children, they had to marry with each other. And then Abraham, he married his half-sister, basically the daughter of his father at least he had she came from a different mother but still that was just like to us no way you know it's messed up so you have to go by that time because why we can perceive that way is in verse one when god uh, told him at verse one and two to offer him as a sacrifice notice at verse three abraham 
wasn't like shocked and said, no, this is so evil at verse three. He just got up in the morning and did it. Yep. It seemed like the norms of that time. What is it? If you study pagan cultures of that time when they did their sacrifices, the norm and the common sense is if you want to really worship your God and honor him, you're going to give up what's best and precious to you. That's what they're thinking. They're not thinking about like, wow, it's an innocent little child and how can you burn it up? And No, that's not their thinking like we are. Right. Our thinking would be that way. You got to think about the age of that time. They don't think like that. They thought it as common sense in the norm. If I really honor this God so much, I'm going to give up what's best to him. Right. See, that's in their heart <coughs> according to the context of that age. So God, what he wants is, I want that best out of you out of the context of that age. Right. See, that's how God does things. Right. That's how God does things. We're going to look at uh, Micah 6. Here's an example, Micah 6. We can see that people during this time period, it was somewhat the norm, at least somewhat the norm, that people offer things to the Lord to their very best. And when they offer their very best to the Lord, it can even be the firstborn. It can be their only begotten. Look at Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6 and verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Uh, and this is talking about what at verse 6? Burnt offerings, right? Okay, keep reading. Shall I give my what? Firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. See that? So that's, what, that's how God does things. Whoa, I, I don't agree with how God does that. No, you better thank God that's how he does it. Amen. Because if he had it his way, and we went by the Mormons and the IFB churches with hundreds of rules... You get all, you'd, uh, you'd be pouting and crying and say, you're just too legalist. You know what's so funny? We're getting that accusation right now. Yeah. We're getting that accusation right now. Well, you're just too legalist. No, your problem is this. When God hits on your values and norms on, okay, let's go by the intention of the heart on what's evil and what's right. And I'm going to be fair. I'm going to go by the context of that age. Okay, I want the best out of your heart. You will whine legalism either way. That's your problem, yeah. okay? That is the spirit of this day and age we live in. Right. I'll just whine. They don't care. They don't care. They'll just whine about anything what God does. Right. He's, too, he's too strict. He's too soft. He's too mean or he's too nice or make up your mind, you yeah. know? Make up your mind. These people, they'll never make up their minds and they'll always critique the Lord. Why? Because that's in their heart they don't care. They just, want to, uh, they just want to mock the Lord. They don't want to believe that there is a real God that exists. Or people, they want to believe in a God to their level that exists so that they can just keep up with their own sin and do whatever pleases them. If there's one thing about your God, he judges you by how you live accordingly to your heart. As a matter of fact... If you look at uh, many verses in your Bible, how God judges people and how God uh, makes decision is accordingly to the uprightness of their own heart. See, what God does, he's such a fair God, he goes by conscience. If you don't believe me, just we looked at Romans too many times. Look up every time the Bible says uprightness of mine heart uprightness of mind heart you'll notice it's by people's own righteousness and their own heart that god goes by and he'll judge them accordingly that's how fair our god is that's how fair our god is well then why won't god do that today simple because look how well you're living uprightly according to the best intentions of your heart you still mess up fool <laughs> You're a fool for thinking that, uh, well, God should do that the same thing. with No, we're not Old Testament Jews. Trust me. Uh, the way we live in our morals is yeah. so loose that yeah. we call it relative now. Yeah. Yeah. That's how bad it is. 
And the only time you'll start to at least clean up your act somewhat is when you have kids, when they mirror and reflect you. See, that's when you wake up a little bit. Uh, you guys are just wicked, evil yeah. people, and that includes yours truly. Amen. So you have to understand that's why God can't do that anymore because he already proved it for thousands of years. I've done that. Yeah. I judge you by the uprightness of your heart and intentions. Abraham passed the test. Other people passed the test, but it's very few. You all fail. So I'm going to write down laws for you, right. but they fail on that one. So then Jesus had to fulfill the law. Yeah. Hence, you can't live by the uprightness of your heart anymore. Right. For God to determine your salvation, you have to receive Christ's righteousness. Amen. Does this make sense? Yep. So notice it's an evolving yeah. throughout time. The values, how God judged it. He, he goes by throughout time how he's seeing different people and then he has to uh, adapt and change the rules in a way where it can make sure that mankind, that they'll be able to meet the standard and that God will be able at the same time be understanding and judge them accordingly. Right. That's how God does it. Not because our God changes and he's a changing God, but rather his dealings change because mankind is always changing. Yeah. Our God's integrity never changes, but we change. So God has to meet up where we're at so that we can understand his unchanging integrity and character. All right, blah, 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 blah. I don't know if that made any sense to you what I said, but let's go to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. <clears throat> Genesis 22. <clears throat> now we're going to continue on at verse 3, verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass. So Abraham got up early in the morning and then he saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. He took two young men and Isaac, his son, with him <clears throat> and clave the wood for the burnt offering. So clave is like holding on to. Like you'll see the Bible mentions about he clave the sword. So like holding fast. So he... Uh, held the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. So, and then they all got up and went to the place where God told him to go. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. It was at the third day that Abraham, he lifted up his eyes. So he saw, that's what the idea is about lifted up his eyes. He saw the place at a distance. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. So Abraham says the young, to the young men that went along with him, Stay here with the donkey. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship. So I and the lad, so obviously you know what lad means. That's referring to Isaac because he's a young boy. That we're going to go over there. That's what yonder means. So because it's a far off, it's a way on a distance. We're going to go over there. That's what yonder is referring to when it's, uh, when it's at a distance and you're going to go over. That's why there's a song in the hymn that we sing. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. The idea is the roll call up in heaven. See, long ways off. When God gives that roll call, we're going to go up there. That's what yonder is referring to. Okay, now... Uh, when we look at this passage, it continues reading, and come again to you. So Abraham says, we're going to go over there, yonder, we're going to worship God, and then we're both going to come back to you. Remember at Hebrews 11, Abraham has such strong faith, he believed that his son is going to come back with him. Why? Because God made, remember, a promise to Abraham through Isaac. Isaac, he's called to produce the rest of your children. So Abraham had such strong faith. That's quite a faith. I don't know about you, but uh, if God asked you to give up your most precious thing, do you have that much faith that God's going to keep his promise on you that he will bless you? He'll take care of you? I mean, uh, oh, that we would have the faith of Abraham. 
It's very sad we don't have that today. Continuing onwards. Verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. All right, so like typical fathers do, Abraham, the dad, he was holding the wood all that time, the wood for the burnt offering, and he said, here, son, hold it. You know, so then Isaac, uh, he laid it upon, his son, uh, upon Isaac, his son. So his son Isaac uh, took the wood. And he took the fire in his hand <clears throat> and a knife, and they went both of them together. So Abraham, obviously, he was Superman, and he was holding fire in his hand and say, hey, look at me. You know, No, obviously, that's not what it means, okay? So we can tell that the fire was not burning in his hand or he was like literally holding fire the idea is with the fire is basically kindling what he's about to burn so you can guess that if that's the case with biblical language and interpretation it is very important to understand that you shouldn't be so nitpicky and think that your bible has a mistake because it said words that just don't make sense it said that corn but there was no corn during that time People just don't understand words or the language of how biblical interpretation is used. The best example is Genesis 22, 6. You think Abraham held fire in his hands? You think God was that stupid? You think that's what God meant? Obviously, God had a different meaning behind it when he used that word. So when you read your Bible, don't be a doofus and think, well, that don't make sense. You know, that's an error. No. When it comes to Bible language, especially the Lord, uh, he's not going to be that stupid. You got you to gotta have an open mind, because I thought that's what uh, higher education taught us. Right, right. You have to have an open mind and think, I wonder if there's a meaning behind the way they use this word, not the way that I would perceive it. So Abraham, he had uh, the fire for kindling. So he had kindling in his hand for fire in his hand. And then he also had a knife because he's going to set up the burnt offering. And then they both of, and both of them went together up there. Verse 7, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, Ah, uh, the fame, uh, famous verses, two of the most famous verses is verse 7 and 8. Isaac his son says to Abraham his father, My father, and he said, Here am I. So Isaac says, Dad, and Abraham answers, I'm here. What's up? Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Isaac says, Behold. So remember, that's the word introducing, signifying to pay attention what we're, what, what we're having here. The fire, the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? I don't see a lamb. So what are we going to do? Verse 8, And Abraham said, this is what Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Amen. So Abraham answers Isaac, hey, son, God's going to provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went both of them together and they continued on. One of the most famous statements ever. We're going to look at the book of John. There are two places that you want to turn to. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Your modern Bible versions ruin that verse. It says that God will provide a lamb. No, that's not what it said. God will provide himself a lamb. That is such a genius statement because it means two things right here. It can go either way. And that's your God. Remember, you, you got to believe they don't know biblical hermeneutics. Your God, the way he talks, is always double application many times. Amen. So, he could say right here, man, it's so brilliant how the, the play on words is used. It can have a double meaning. Historically, at that time, you could probably say that Abraham was referring that, you know, God's going to provide some other means. He's going to provide uh, for himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So he's going to provide. So you can say that historically, but then the Lord, he sees beyond that. Yeah. He doesn't just see a historical meaning. He also sees, and this is the problem with Bible scholars today, they only stick to historical, and then they fall into the figurative interpretation. Yeah. That's wrong. You can't do that. What you've got to do is 
Went through the historical, God could be seeing a picture beyond that will fulfill prophecy. They don't look at the prophetic interpretation. The prophetic interpretation is that God himself will be the lamb. God's going to provide who? Himself, the lamb. That's the idea. Look at John 1, if you don't believe me. Look at John 1. Who's the lamb that God provides? It's himself. It's himself. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and we'll read verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. Who did God provide as the Lamb? The next day, verse 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. It's Amen. he himself, God, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's why Jesus knew when you go to John chapter 8, go to John chapter 8, and we'll conclude it. John chapter 8. Jesus is the Lamb, correct? If Jesus is the Lamb, why did Jesus say to the Pharisees, you know, Abraham, he saw me. And he was glad to see it. How did Abraham see Jesus? There's only one. Only one verse. And there's only one way. There's no other way. It's that statement Abraham made. God will provide himself a lamb. Remember, Abraham's also known as a prophet. Remember that? So when he gives these statements, he could be also seeing something ahead. Hence, we have to understand, Jesus knew that statement at Genesis 22 was about him. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. How about that? Verse 57, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Uh -oh. yeah. Who's, who is Jesus talking about? He's talking about himself being that lamb. That's how Abraham saw him. So, if modern Bible versions don't think that's a big deal then tell them, what is Jesus talking about at John 8 then? Yeah. Yeah. Then they're breaking Scripture prophecy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I thought that it's not a big deal with modern Bible versions, how they were things. No, it is a big deal to God. They just broke Scripture. That's how serious and blasphemous modern Bible versions can be. Right. So use that against your modern Bible version critics one day. Tell them, yeah, it's a big deal, this verse, because... You just broke scripture. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer with that thought. Father God, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers. Increase our knowledge for the script, uh, of the scriptures. Bless the next service, the fellowship, and everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.